Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the forum webinar series. I'm Leslie Kanan, Senior Field Officer for the National Trust for Historic Preservation. In case you don't know, Preservation Leadership Forum is the professional membership program of the National Trust for Historic Preservation. This webinar series is made possible by members of Preservation Leadership Forum, and we sincerely thank those of you who are with us today. Through our African American Cultural Heritage Action Fund, we bring you today's webinar called Brown v. Board, A Tale of Three Delaware Schools. And we will be exploring the role of three sites in Delaware, the former Claymont High School, the former Hocassin Colored School Number 107C, and the former Howard High School in the segregating America's school system. While these sites are separated by geography, they are brought together by history, court cases, and a very basic and fundament fundamental issue. African-American parents seeking to have equal education, transportation, or facilities for their children. Before we begin, here are a few technical logistics. We will take questions from the audience during the webinar. Please send questions via the Q&A function directly to panelists. You are also welcome to submit at any point during the webinar, but we will be waiting until the Q&A section to answer questions. You are also encouraged to communicate to all participants through the chat function. Dr. Lynette Edwards is a historian and an expert on this history. She will be available in the chat to answer some of your questions. The closed caption, captioning function is enabled for this webinar. You can enable it and disable it either through the controls at the bottom of your Zoom screen or through your audio settings, depending on what version of Zoom you are using. Following the program, we will send out a recording of today's webinar directly to the email you use to register. And finally, all forum webinars are archived in our forum webinar library. And now let's get started. Thanks, Leslie. Uh, it's been a joy and a pleasure to get to know the Delaware communities and many of the speakers you'll hear from today. My name is Pam Bowman. I'm with the National Trust for Historic Preservation. And I've been working as part of the team um, to get some legislation established to deal with the history of the landmark Brown versus Board of Education Supreme Court case. The Delaware communities, along with the communities of Virginia, Washington, DC, South Carolina, and Kansas, we've all been collectively working towards preserving and protecting a number of sites associated with that court case. And before we hear from our speakers, we wanted to share with you some information about the multi-state effort to support federal legislation that would really provide an opportunity for the public to learn of the stories of all the court cases in those communities while preserving historic locations. Bipartisan and bicameral legislation has been introduced in the House and Senate, led by Representative Clyburn in the House and Senator Coons from Delaware in the Senate. And both have been instrumental leaders on preserving this history. Next slide, please. We are honored and privileged to be able to work with the Office of United States Senator Chris Coons on this legislative proposal. Senator Coons has served as United States Senator for Delaware since his election in 2010, and he sits on a number of committees, including appropriations, judiciary, foreign relations, small business and entrepreneurship, and the ethics committee. And the Senator has been a strong supporter of historic preservation and a leader of the Brown versus Ford legislative effort. Unfortunately, the Senator was not able to join us today, but he recorded for all of you a message that we'll play now. Good afternoon. I'm Senator Chris Coons from Delaware, and I'm glad to be joining the National Trust's African American Cultural Heritage Action Fund Forum webinar on the Brown versus Board of Education Supreme Court case today. The Brown versus Board of Education case has rightfully found its place in American history as one of the most significant Supreme Court decisions in our nation's history and a turning point in our country's long arc towards achieving greater racial justice. Yet many people never learn the full history of the several lawsuits across several different states that were ultimately consolidated into what became that one famous Brown versus Board case. And even fewer know that three schools in Delaware 
played a critical role in desegregating America's school system. Those three schools were Howard High School in Wilmington, Delaware, so-called Hocassin Colored School from the tiny town of Hocassin, Delaware, and Claymont High School, Claymont, which became the first high school to be integrated in any of the 17 states with legal segregation. These three sites are related to two legal cases in Delaware that were later consolidated into Brown versus Board. And those two cases are Belton versus Gebhardt, involving the desegregation of Delaware's high schools, and Beulah versus Gebhardt. Beulah started with a mother, Sarah Beulah, just fighting to get her daughter, Shirley, a chance to ride the bus that literally went past their house so that her daughter could ride the bus to the so-called colored school in Hokessin. Both of these cases were led by the first African-American admitted to the Delaware bar, legendary attorney Louis L. Redding, who led the fight to desegregate Delaware's public schools. These cases were heard in Delaware's unique court of chancery, something that goes back to the colonial era, a separate court that hears arguments in equity, where young Chancellor C.J. Seitz had the courage to rule that the doctrine of separate but equal, although still the law, was a lie in practice in Delaware. And he ordered the Delaware State Board of Education to open all schools in Delaware to African Americans in order to address the gross inequality in their conditions. The Delaware decision was the only decision of the five consolidated court cases that the US Supreme Court affirmed in Brown versus Board of Education. Chancellor Seitz's decision was unanimously affirmed by the Delaware Supreme Court, and that's the case that was affirmed by the US Supreme Court. I grew up down the road from one of these schools in Little Hocus in Delaware. My mom was a public school teacher, yet I never learned about the history in a classroom close to home. Rather, it wasn't until many years later in law school that I learned the pivotal and painful facts of these cases. That's why I'm so dedicated to working to add these sites to the National Registry and why I'm so grateful for the tireless work of the National Trust to elevate these three sites in Delaware and their stories as part of the larger historical narrative of the advancement of civil rights in our nation. I'm proud to partner with the trust and colleagues here in the Congress, um, senators and representatives Blunt Rochester from Delaware and Clyburn from South Carolina on the bipartisan Brown versus Board of Education National Historic Site Expansion Act. Here in the Senate, that's Senate Bill 270, and it would expand the Brown versus Board National Historic Site in Topeka, Kansas to include additional sites from South Carolina, Virginia, Washington, DC, and Delaware. Our legislation would provide the opportunity for these sites to be fully understood, to tell their own under-recognized, uplifting stories about the historic figures who helped shape American history and society. Preserving these sites also ensures that future generations are able to learn about the power of perseverance determination and unity in overcoming the impact, the brutal and long impact that the separate but equal doctrine had on our nation and the education of our nation's children. History, if not remembered, will be repeated. Today's webinar is yet another great opportunity, a good program put on by the trust in service of ensuring that this powerful Delaware history not be forgotten. Thank you for playing that video. Um, I hope you'll all join me in sharing your thanks to Senator Coons and their staff for all the incredible work uh, that's gone on into this legislative proposal. Um, and on the next slide, um, on your screen, you'll see a little bit of information about the legislation that Senator Coons was speaking about. Um, this is uh, legislation that's been introduced in both the House and the Senate. You'll see the bill numbers here and the leaders of each bill and original co-sponsors uh, that have joined in this effort to support getting this legislation passed, hopefully by the end of this Congress. This bipartisan and bicameral bill has tremendous support since its introduction. It has 100% participation by the House and Senate offices representing the expansion sites. And as, along with the Kansas senators uh, that represent the Topeka, Kansas site. Um, in the National Park Service. But we still need your help uh, to get this bill a vote in the House or Senate and get it to the President's desk. 
We've had two hearings in the House and Senate and the Senate committee passed the bill unanimously. But in order to move the board for, uh, board bill forward, uh, we could use your help by joining us in visiting the website that's listed on your screen. You can go to savingplaces.org and we have a free tool where you can contact your members of Congress and ask them to support the legislation in any way possible as the legislation moves forward. Um, I will now turn it back over to Leslie who can introduce our first speaker. Thank you, Pam. Um, so the next, our next um, set of speakers are gonna be from Howard High School of Technology and it's gonna be Kyle Hill and Beatrice Patton Dixon. Um, so first, Kyle Hill's success in both urban and suburban schools is proof that his positive mindset and hard charging work ethic is the formula that can be led to the transformation much of, to both much of education's needs today. He earned a bachelor's degree in elementary education from the University of Maine, a master's in adult learning from Virginia Tech, and a certificate in educational leadership and administration from George Mason University. He is currently pursuing his doctorate in educational leadership from Wilmington University. We also have Beatrice Patton Dixon. She's a native from Delaware whose family has lived in the state for more than 250 years. She attended historic Howard High School, Howard University, and the University of Pennsylvania School of Law. Beatrice worked in the law offices of the Honorable Leonard L. Williams and with Louis L. Redding Esquire, both of whom were also Howard High School graduates. In the 1970s, when the federal courts in Wilmington ordered the implementation of their desegregation orders in the Brown case, Beatrice helped organize and served as an officer in the Coalition to Save Our Children, the community-based organization that federal courts recognized and appointed as the legal representatives of the African-American children subject, subject to, subjected sorry, to the 1970s implementation of the educational desegregation in the new Castle County, Delaware. So now we will hear from Howard High School. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Beatrice Patton Dixon of the Howard High School Alumni Association. And I will be presenting the first portion of Howard's uh, segment on Brown versus the Board of Education. I, along with Principal Kyle Hill, will do this. It is extraordinarily difficult, obviously, to talk about 155 years of history in 10 minutes, so I'm going to go through this quickly. And if there are any questions, I'd be glad to answer them at the end of the presentation. Slide one contains pictures of the current physical plant of 1927 historic Howard High School and the 1993 renamed Howard High School of Technology. The front of the building to the left is a 1927 historic Howard High School with its annex in the rear and the buildings to the right were added in 1975 during the 70s Brown implementation when the school was then renamed Howard Career Center. After a great outcry from the black community about the name change, it changed again in 1993 and renamed to the Howard High School of Technology. Howard High School is 155 years old and it is the oldest continuously operated and publicly funded high school in Delaware. It was originally built for blacks by the Freedmen's Bureau with federal funds and relocated and rebuilt by philanthropist Pierre DuPont in 1927. Slide two, please. Slide two shows a view of both buildings again with the signage indicating the National Park Service's April 5th, 2005 designation of Howard High School as a national, uh, uh, because of its role in Brown at, on the National Register of Historical Places. Slide three, please. The story of how Howard High School became a part of the Brown decision and Delaware's funding of the public education is about a tale of two schools and two races of people, one black Howard High School and one white Claymont High School. It is about who paid for what for the public education of Delaware's black and white students. The federal government paid for the initial building of Howard High School after the Civil War and philanthropist P. 
Pierre DuPont used his personal funds to pay for relocating the building as a high school for black students in 1927. Black students paid for their own school transportation costs to go past their neighborhood schools and Claymont High School to attend Howard High School, which for many years was the only high school Delaware's black students could attend. Black parents were required to pay taxes to support the publicly financed and more well-resourced Claymont High School and other white schools in Delaware, but their children were not permitted to attend. It is a tale about how Delaware exhibited a great disparity in the apportionment of public funds to educate its black students. It is also about the additional burdensome personal funds Delaware's black parents expended to educate their children. For decades prior to Brown, black students throughout the state who wanted a high school education were required to pay for their own personal housing, bus and transportation costs to ride past Claymont High School and Delaware's other white high schools in or near their neighborhoods to attend Howard High School. Slide four. When DuPont built Howard High School for black students in 1927, the school was state of the art in the nation. And he was hoping that he'd be able to encourage the Delaware General Assembly to invest more money in schools for all of Delaware's children. Instead, they built more publicly funded schools for Delaware's white students. Slide five. From the time Howard was built in 1867 until the schools were integrated, Howard High School attracted some of the best national black teaching talent. Prior to integration, most of Howard's black teachers had been educated at the nation's most prestigious HBCUs and Ivy League schools. Yet, those same teachers were not permitted to teach at white schools in Delaware because of segregation. Their cultural competence and understanding of Howard students allowed Howard students to secure excellent educations and educational experiences. Slide six. Delaware had two mass implementations of the Brown decision one in 1954 and the other in 1978. My personal experiences with the 1950s implementation of Brown and in going from the smaller nurturing all black Douglas Elementary School and Kindergarten to the larger previous and then still mostly white Lower Elementary School in first grade. It was a very hostile environment because Lohr was a much larger school and I never had a black teacher or another black student in my classrooms throughout my elementary school education there. Integration of Howard in the 70s meant that over time, while Howard's student body integrated, most of the teaching and administrative staff gradually became a lot less black and a lot more white, and this pattern continues today. Slide seven. There was a much greater significance and impact made by the Brown decision and the Howard High School and the other plaintiff schools role in it. The case was decided on the very narrow issue of the integration of the nation's schools. Brown's broader significance was in overturning the 1896 Plessy versus Ferguson decision, wherein the court had determined that as long as separate public accommodations were made for blacks, it was legally permissible to have separate facilities for the races. The Brown decision changed the court's earlier separate but equal precedent in education and led the way later for integration of restaurants, hotels, and other pub public accommodations. Mr. Redding was very active in legally pursuing and assuring the success of the implementation of the integration of Delaware's schools, restaurants, hotels, and other public accommodations. Slide eight. There are four high schools in the Newcastle County Votech District today, which includes Howard. 
The other three schools were built at least 102 years after Howard. Howard currently has the least number of students of the four schools and therefore less state funding resources. Black students in all four VOTEC schools, including Howard and Delaware's private and charter schools, are currently voicing concerns about encountering racial bias in their schools. This is happening today in the 21st century. In conclusion, America is on the verge of for forging a new economic and educational path, but owing to human nature, our painful past practices and old ways of doing things are reemerging. It is only when the true stories about America's past educational injustices are fully captured and constantly displayed in public view that we can begin to fully honestly and truthfully address them and have the opportunity to eliminate them. Today we are back where we started because we have failed to arm ourselves with the true history and stories of our past. We cannot afford as a nation to regress back into the racist misdeeds of America's past. Thank you very much for your attention. And now Mr. Hill will tell you about the good things that are happening at the Howard High School of Technology today. Mr. Hill, to you. Slide nine, please. Good afternoon. Thank you, Ms. Dixon. Uh, in my tenure here as principal of Howard High School for the last three years, my charge and my mission along with my staff uh, is to not make this school a, a secret anymore. We want this to be the best well-known secret. And over the last three years, we have increased our enrollment significantly. Um, in my first year, we were at 750 to this year to 900. The goal is to be at capacity of, of 1,000 students, and we're well on our way um, to advertise what we do here. Our, our goal and mission is to provide students in Newcastle County um, with world-class CTE, career and technical education experiences. We have state-of-the-art facilities. All of our CTE instructors come from, um, come from the field um, and industry and are educating our students in all the techniques that uh, we are trying to prepare them for to go out into the workforce right away. Our newest program, we have 14 careers, but the newest one is Teacher Academy. And one way um, that our district is preparing our students is to look at a national need. We all know that educators are dwindling in numbers. Uh, fewer and fewer students are, are enrolling in education programs in universities. So Newcastle County, Votech, and Howard are taking on the initiative to not only prepare um, black and brown students to go into the field, but also come back and teach in Delaware. Uh, we also are looking at dual enrollment opportunities, looking for uh, opportunities for our students to have partnerships with colleges and universities nearby um, to make sure that we are leaving students with the opportunity to either leave with a certification and or college credit. Uh, we have different community uh, initiatives. One is called the FAM Forever Movement. Um, as Ms. Dixon spoke about, um, racial tensions um, sparked to a new high with several cases two summers ago. Um, and we wanted to give students a voice um, and within our diversity, equity, and inclusion work. Uh, we are also grooming leaders. So we have two programs, Howard Leading Ladies and Howard Men of Distinction. So in addition to building them academically um, and building them in their CTE courses, we're also honing in on their leadership skills. Next slide. Amidst all of the impact of the pandemic over the last two years, Howard still has a graduation rate of 92%, which is uh, something we're extremely proud of. Um, as part of our program, we often looked for our students to have the opportunity to go and co-op and work in the fields that they spent three years studying. We want them to have real world uh, experiences and paid internships. We have uh, more than 40 local businesses within the city um, and the surrounding areas that employ our students. 80% um, of our students, our, our seniors, are eligible to participate. Um, in addition to our academics and our CTE, we have championship athletics um, and all of our sports to uh, have our students have a more well-rounded experience. Next slide. My goal is to be the bridge between um, the shoulders we stand on from the original Howard 
uh, Howard uh, Skill Center and, and now Howard School of Technology, it is important for us to, to look at the facilities we have, educate our current students on uh, the history of the school they attend, and not only educate them, but connect them uh, to alumni like Ms. Dixon. Uh, we have opportunities where our students are able to connect and participate in activities where we honor uh, alumni from the past, but also participate in their program that they have currently. We have some upcoming program initiatives that we're looking to uh, really highlight, um, creating courses and educate uh, where students can walk the hallways. So we're gonna work with the University of Delaware potentially to create a Howard history that every student in Howard will get an opportunity to learn about so they get to see the facilities, but also learn more um, in-depth history about the, the school that they attend. We have a current partnership with Wilmington Police um, and the State Police um, to increase the number of minority students that are going into law enforcement. Um, again, I spoke of uh, the racial tension that sparked with the George Floyd case, um, but only through education and through communication um, that we can better the circumstance in the community. We need people from the community to police the community and be more aware of what's going on uh, in their own communities. In addition, uh, we have added uh, information technology program where our students will earn 30 college credits upon graduation, where they will attend Dell Tech uh, for one additional year and will be able to transfer right into a four-year university. So Howard is on the cutting edge in so many ways and continuing to carry the torch that was set in 1927. Next slide. This is just a few images um, of the finished construction in our 1927 building. Um, our students get a chance to walk the halls of a historic building, but in a world-class setting. So we are extremely proud of where we're going. Uh, we are extremely proud of the lineage that we come from. Um, and I urge you all, if you haven't had a chance to come visit, please come visit us. If you have eighth grade students who are looking for a high school home, I urge you to come take a tour. Our staff is amazing. Uh, we have an outstanding culture and climate and we are on the rise. So I thank you for giving us the opportunity to share a little bit of our school today um, and for you to learn about where our school came from. So thank you. Thank you, <clears throat> thank you so much. Um, next, uh, we have Claymont High School with Allison David and Joan Anderson. So first, Allison David is the Chief Executive Officer of the Claymont Community Center. Allison is driven by the desire to help people make positive changes in their lives through her hand up, not hand out worldview. For three decades, she has created, designed and executed and grown effective social service programs and services. Relationships and connections are focal points of her efforts as she believes people who work together grow stronger together. She strives to, maxim to maximize mission impact by building mutually beneficial partnerships within our diverse communities. Allison seeks to involve stakeholders from across the community, families, businesses, nonprofit organizations, elected and appointed government leaders, and other key stakeholders to expand the center's scope and reach. Then we have Joan Elizabeth Anderson, who was born in 1938 to Dr. Leon and Beulah Anderson in Wilmington, Delaware. She attended Wilmington Elementary and Howard High Schools. The Anderson family moved to Ardencroft, a suburb of Claymont, Delaware in the late spring of 1952 at the invitation of the Ardencroft community, which wanted black families to live there. She attended Claymont High School and became part of the Brown v. Board of Education lawsuit. Joan graduated from Claymont in 1956. She next attended Fisk University in Nashville, Tennessee for two years and transferred to Boston University, where she graduated in 1960 with a BFA degree. In 2006, Joan was honored along with 11 other Claymont students with a plaque, first state, first school, first student to integrate. And the Delaware State Senate honored her with a certificate of appreciation for being part of the first court mandated integration of a public school in the United States. Now I give you Claymont High School. Thank you, Leslie. Uh, it is absolutely a pleasure to join everyone for this webinar. Uh, the Claymont story is a story of bravery, 
It's a story of doing what's right and it's a legacy for the community. Next slide. Claymont High School was built in Claymont, Delaware in 1924. Its story of integration is truly an example of the community working together in order to integrate. The story demonstrates the bravery of so many people and I'm honored to be part of telling this story. I wanna thank the people that I interviewed for this presentation and specifically my co-presenter, Joan, who will be speaking shortly. Next slide. As you heard, in 1950, the only high school open to African-American students in Delaware was Howard High School. This meant that children in Claymont were forced to literally pass by Claymont High School and travel 20 miles round trip to Howard. The parents wanted their kids in their local schools. So they sought legal counsel from Lewis Redding, the prominent African-American attorney who urged them to seek admission into Claymont High School. Their children were denied. And in July of 1951, Redding filed a lawsuit seeking their admission. Reading set out to challenge the notion of, of racially segregated public schools and developed litigation using the name of one of the parents in the Claymont case, Ethel Belton. The case named the State Board of Education as the principal defendant and the board members were specifically charged. The first name among the members was Francis B. Gebhardt, resulting in the case filed as Belton versus Gebhardt. In the meantime, the local Claymont Schools Board knew that in order to integrate, there would have to be a lawsuit and they were in support of that. Virginia Tryon is the daughter of Sager Tryon, a member of the local school board at the time. She recalls that her father and others wanted the community to integrate because it was simply the right thing to do. Everyone knew that they were facing a tough legal battle but the parents and the school board bravely decided to move forward. In April of 1952, Chancellor Collins J. Seitz, presiding judge of the Delaware Court of Chancery, directed the immediate admittance of the African-American plaintiff's children into Claymont High School. His decision was, was appealed, but upheld by the Delaware Supreme Court. Next slide. Based on Chancellor Seitz's decision, Claymont High School prepared to admit 12 African-American students in September of 1952. On September 3rd, the local Claymont School Board called the Attorney General every hour uh, waiting for an official mandate. Virginia remembers that her father Sager was pacing the floors of their house all day waiting for that call. At a special late night meeting, they received a call from the State Board of Education giving them verbal permission for the children to be admitted. On September 4th, the African-American students attended the first day of high school. On September 5th, unfortunately, the Delaware Attorney General called the school board chair with instructions to send the children home because the case had been appealed. They defied that order. They allowed the children to stay. This was another moment when everyday people simply did the right thing. Next slide. The original students admitted to Claymont High School are referred to as the Claymont 12. 11 of the students began school and one student decided to stay at Howard High School. These are truly civil rights pioneers. Next slide. I am deeply honored to introduce Joan Anderson, one of the original Claymont 12 and a graduate of Claymont High School, class of 1956. Joan will be sharing her thoughts on those early days and the legacy of this decision. Joan. Hello, I'm happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me to this webinar. And I'm excited to tell my story about Claymont High. I was there for four years and I graduated in 1956. But my story begins in Wilmington, has been noted here that um, my family was born and I, I was raised there. Uh, Wilmington, Delaware was uh, segregated, but there were several integrated residential areas and my family lived in one of them. So actually I grew up playing with uh, children from all races. So I had some integration there, a little bit there before I, eventually moved to Claymont. 
And um, we did move to Arden Croft in uh, 1952. We weren't part of the Belton versus Board of Education case at that point because we weren't there when it started in 1951. But we moved in the spring of uh, 1952 where the case was um, in the uh, Delaware Supreme Court. And in August of uh, 28th, when the case was uh, upheld, we were able then to attend Claymont. And just to tell you, it, it was a little disconcerting at the time because um, we didn't know where we were gonna go to school until we got that uh, phone call that um, um, Allison was uh, uh, talking about that we could actually attend Claymont. And so we did attend on the 4th. We were admitted um, on the 5th, we, did, we were there. And, um, but on the 4th, we actually attended school and it was um, incredibly uh, a good situation that day because we were so well received. In Claymont, the city of Claymont, both races lived in the same area side by side. So there was a lot of um, interaction, uh, the both races and they both wanted integration. And that's what helped make uh, Claymont successful. The uh, school board at Claymont wanted integration. The um, both races wanted integration. And so they fought for it. They even did a couple of things that were illegal to achieve it, but they, they just decided that they should live together, that they should go to school together. And so that's what happened. We went to school. My mother had told me later that uh, the teachers came up to her, hugged her and thanked her for sending her children there. So it, it turned out to be a really good experience. It was like um, kept undercover so that there were no reporters, there were no um, marches, there was just nothing. We just automatically went to school that day, September 4th. And um, for, for the next four years, it was a really good experience because uh, I had already been in a semi-integrated environment in Wilmington. Then I moved to Arden Croft, which was a completely white uh, neighborhood, and then into Claymont, which was uh, now integrated. And so um, it was just a, a, a really good experience, but I have to say that there were about three incidences that happened, but they were swiftly dealt with by the uh, school board. One of them involved my oldest sister when she graduated two years later. Uh, the students were supposed to walk down the aisle, the one boy on one side and then next, would be, uh, next to him would be a girl. But when the boy who was um, supposed to walk down with, with my sister Merle, um, he, he uh, ran out before he um, you know, could uh, walk down with her. But the boy behind her uh, immediately just walked up and took his place and nobody really um, noticed what had happened, but the school board did notice. And uh, when the diplomas were given out, his was blank, but eventually it, they did give him his diploma. Another um, incident was when my sister Carol was uh, taunted by a, a boy. A teacher um, saw it, heard it, went over and just slapped the boy. Uh, you couldn't get away with that today, but in those days you could. You, if you were slapped by the teacher and you went home and told your parents what happened, they would ask you, what did you do to deserve that? So um, it, was, it was just a different time. And, um, but things were going well for me and uh, for the rest of the students. In fact, I could say that um, when Howard High's football team came to um, play our team, this is how you could tell uh, how we really felt about being in Claymont because we all sat on the Claymont side. We had an opportunity to go sit on the Howard High side, but we all 11 of us sat on the Claymont side and it, um, this was just how we felt about the school. We were so well received, but it also, uh, my takeaway from this is the unity of the two races together. And that's what I've taken into uh, past um, Claymont, into Howard High, into um, Fisk University and Boston University, and into my life today is the unity. Things worked 
uh, better together when people are united, the races are united. And so this is my story. And I, I really enjoyed the four years that I had at Claymont. Thank you. Joan, thank you so much. I wish we had more time because you have, I know, a lot more stories to share. Um, you bring this presentation to life. Um, I have a bunch of slides with uh, dates, uh, but your shared experience is just wonderful. So thank you. Next slide, please. Uh, I also interviewed Martha Trotter, one of the other Claymont 12. Um, while I think what the students did was tremendously brave, uh, she didn't see herself that way. Uh, in fact, she wanted me to point out uh, her thoughts around the bravery of the parents. And she said, our parents should be honored for fighting for their children. They were the ones that got the ball rolling. And I couldn't agree more. While it wasn't perfect, the integration in Claymont was peaceful and remains an important part of the Delaware story. We are proud to be one of the cases cited in Brown versus the Board of Education. Next slide. Claymont High School is now home to the Claymont Community Center, a nonprofit anchor in the community for over 45 years. We think it's extremely special to note that Sager Tryon, who was on the local Claymont School Board, was also one of our founding members. This legacy of inclusion and diversity is central to our mission to enhance the community by addressing the human needs of wellness, belongingness, and esteem. We provide educational, recreational, and social support to all people, and all people are welcomed here. We are thrilled to be part of this larger conversation to recognize the contribution that Claymont High School made to end separate but equal education, and we work with the community now to continue to push for full equity for all Americans. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joan and Allison. That was a great presentation. Next, we have Hokeston Colored School number 107C with David Wilk and Sunny Knott. David Wilk is the board chair of Friends of Hokeston Colored School number 107C. He is also an assistant professor of finance and director of the real estate program at Temple University Fox School of Business. He's over 30 years of real estate teaching experience between the University of Delaware Learner College of Business, Johns Hopkins Carey Business School, and Georgetown University. Mr. Wilk is also a management consultant who creates a value in today's market for corporations, private equity firms, governments, universities, healthcare systems, and nonprofits through asset optimization strategies that generate new earnings, valuations, market feasibility studies, placemaking, economic development strategies, and innovative marketing plans. We also have James Sunny Knott, who's on the board of Friends of Hokeston Colored School number 107C. More importantly, he actually attended Hokeston from 1937 to 1944. He was an avid baseball player, having been close friends with the legendary Judy Johnson. And he's also been a mentor at DeCastle High School, impacting many public school students. Next, we'll hear from Hokeston. Thank you very much, Leslie. And uh, thank you so much for the National Trust for giving us the ability to share our stories about uh, Delaware's role in Brown v. Board of Education. It's really a treat to be here. And uh, given our timing, we'll, we'll work through. Um, again, I'm David Wilk. I'm chair of the um, Hokeston, Friends of Hokeston Colored School, number 107. And we're a nonprofit public charity that was brought together in 2012 to save the former Hokeston School from sheriff's sale because it had been um, subject to mechanics liens and it was about a week away from being sheriff's sale and losing the legacy of this priceless community asset. So all of us at Friends of Hokeston Colored School, next slide please, um, are volunteers. And everyone on this page has spent, we're a, uh, as I said in our last year's Brown v. Board of Education Delaware Day, we're a 10 year overnight success. 
and uh, being, being able to look back 10 years and say, wow, we were able to save the school. But the most important thing about our mission, and it really builds on what you've heard so eloquently from the Howard, Howard High School of Technology and Claymont Community Center speakers before us, is that these three places are priceless assets with monumental history behind them. And the events of today, the events starting in 2020 have really reignited the need to never forget this history and to be able to use this history as a catalyst for creating better human behavior and the future. And, um, and that's really where we spent the lion's share of our journey as friends of Hocassin Colored School to be able to come up with the concept of building, taking the history and the inspiration of Beulah v. Gebhardt, which happened at, at our school, and have it transform this place into a value creation vehicle for all people in the future. And so our mission is very simple transforming Hocuston School number 107C into a center for diversity, inclusion, and social equity. Next slide, please. And what a amazing canvas to paint this future vision on than the history of the school. You can see the legendary Brown v. Board legal team, including Lewis Redding and Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall and uh, Oliver Hill, Robert Carter and Spotswood Robinson. And then you can see that the two primary cases in Delaware that became fundamental to Brown v. Board were Beulah v. Gebhardt versus Belton v. Gebhardt as well. So uh, Emma Lazarus couldn't put it any better. Until we are all free, we are none of us free. And so we're, next slide please. So we're what we're really doing is we're taking this building, and this is a rendering of what it's looked like. We're actually under construction. This building was originally built in 1920 by Pierre S. Dupont, and it was one of the only colored schools that was built by Pierre Dupont in the state of Delaware that happened to be built out of beautiful red brick, and it still exists today. We, we uh, just had the brick repointed. It's just a little small building, 2,200 plus or minus square feet. Next slide, please. And what had happened under the previous owners is they had done an expansion to the building. And unfortunately, they tore down the historic rear wall of the original school building. So we were left to come up with an idea on how to reimagine and, and renovate and refurbish this. So the idea will be to, we added a uh, 277 square foot addition as part of our phase one of our center. Next slide, please. And then as we evolved a little bit more, we said, well, we want to keep as much of the building intact as possible because of its historic character. But if we're putting a large patio out there, why don't we cover the patio with a beautiful canopy that allows us to not only use the 2,000 square feet that we have, but also to add another 1,500 to 2,000 square feet of usable space. So next slide, please. This is what it looks like as of about a week and a half ago. We have five acres, which is really a gift to be able to, um, to enjoy and create indoor and outdoor events. And uh, we are under construction. And the, uh, if everything goes well, we will be able to get a certificate of occupancy at some point in June of this year, which is right around the corner. So again, the whole idea is we have this amazing history of Beulah v. Gebhardt and Brown v. Board of Education, but how do we really take something from a programming and from a inspirational standpoint and really turn it into something that has incredible impact for the community into the future? And so that's really, and where we began, next slide, please. We began, oh, that, this is just the uh, floor plan just showing how the rooms will be redesigned, where we'll have exhibits and a sound studio to do national 
podcast, a multi-purpose room, and a conference room. And next slide, please. And But where it really all began in the beginning of our journey was with the former students who are still alive today who went to the school, including our, um, our leader, uh, Sonny Knott, who I'd, I'm happy to introduce to all of you right now. Sonny, welcome, and you know, please feel free to share your perspectives. Sonny, if you can turn on your video and uh, unmute your unmute your uh, mic. There we go. And then just the mic too. Okay. Perfect. No, uh, can you hear me now? We can. Thank you very okay, much. Okay, great. Great. Yes, I have the, the fortunate good time of attending the 107C. I um, started there in 1937 in the second grade because my family originally was in Maryland and I attended the first grade down there in a little town called Allentown. But coming to Hulkeston was a, a treat for me. And this school is very, very important to the few of us that's left because I'm in my 90s, so you know there's not many of us left right now, so we're looking forward to this, this great day. Um, when I attended to the 107, it was a one-room school with six grades and one teacher. And I've been asked many times, uh, how did the teacher control all of you kids with only, by, by herself? But you have to realize, back during that day, there was a lot of discipline. And the last thing we wanted was for our parents to come to school because you messed up. Because my mother came to school, you can bet I just made her lay down there and die because she was going to kill me anyway. They didn't tolerate the disrespect that goes on now in some of the schools. But we had one room with six rows of seats. Each row of seats was a grade. You went one, two, three, four. When you got to the sixth grade, you left there and you went to Howard. As it's been mentioned before, Howard is the only high school in the state of Delaware. So you see, that's why this is so important to us. We're looking forward to that day uh, in, in June that when we can all gather together and walk through that door one more time. We just wanna walk through that wide door. It's been closed so long. And we, we're so excited that the Historical Society is, is saving this building. That way I can bring my grandchildren to show them where I got to start because people don't believe that you went to a one-room school and accomplished all you have to the day. But that's what we did and we're thankful for it. So I, once again, I thank the committee and all those that are involved and we look forward to the great day. Hopefully by the end of June, I'll still be here. God bless you. Thank you so much, Sonny. You have to be here. That is our mission and you are our motivation and you're such a, you and Leroy and Charlotte and Robert and Blanche and Charlie and Lois, all of the students that we've had. That's the greatest gift of all for us at Hope Kesson is to get to know all of you and to see the sheer joy in your eyes and to know the joy in your heart of being able to take this place of incredible meaning in so many people's lives and uh, turning it into something that's going to have a whole new life. We're going to light it up in this place in the future, Sonny, in your and all the other students' honor. And so getting into the programming, next slide, please. This is where the secret sauce is for what we're going to do, our programming focus. And I'd like to introduce Dr. Lynette Edwards, who has been incredibly uh, active and involved in uh, pushing our uh, programming focus into the schools and also working in a number of different areas. So Lynette, welcome to our program. Hello, thank you, David, for a warm invitation. And thank you everyone for allowing me to be a part 
of this wonderful uh, webinar. As you're looking at the slide, I just want to give a little bit of information about our center. Uh, without reading the slide to you, just give you a little bit more background of what our center is about in the program focus. Our center incorporates the legacy and presence of the African American Schoolhouse in Hocassin, Delaware, and there are three pillars of that legacy. The first one is the initial schoolhouse structure. There was a structure in 1829, a structure in 1878, and a structure in 1920. The second of those pillars is that single room brick house built by Pierre S. DuPont, which operated uh, as a school from 1920 to 1959. And our third pillar of our legacy is the Hokessen case of Beulah v. Gephardt, which became an affiliate case of the Brown v. Board of Education um, 1954 decision. So from the well-documented letter writing campaign of Mr. Fred Beulah and his second wife, Miss Sarah Beulah, on behalf of their adopted daughter, Shirley Barbara Beulah, all the way to the filing of the Beulah v. Gephardt case, which occurred on August the 17th, 1951 by attorney Lewis Redding. The Hocassin Color School 107 role in education has remained a living history for student learning. Um, as you're looking at this slide, we're talking about what our center will be involved in. And our center is engaged in tangible actions to broaden educational horizons and experiences throughout our state. We are currently collaborating with our elected officials who have passed legislation here in the state, House Bill number 198, to address and embrace the contributions of our hidden figures. That would include the Beulah v. Gephardt case and the Belton v. Gephardt case. Uh, our center will provide workshops and training programs and opportunities for participants to engage in personal and professional development in a location that epitomizes what we like to say the hopes of the domestic tranquility that we want to see among humankind. We at the Friends of Hocus and Color School 107 unite with our partner sites to provide a narrative of our state's involvement in that monumental US Supreme Court decision. So on April the 1st, 1952, the Delaware Court of Chancery set that cornerstone for our nation. On August 28, 1952, the Delaware Supreme Court laid the foundation. And on May 17, 1954, the United States Supreme Court, our nation chartered that new course for American education. In incorporating our Hocassin role of 107, it is our hope that our living history for our student learning in that small building along with our diversity training workshop programs and a safe place to have community conversations will help us become that wonderful hub for innovation and collaboration. We're so looking forward to the trajectory of opening our new center and all of you being involved in coming to Delaware to share in our wonderful celebration of what we have done here in the state of Delaware to open the conversation about the pinnacle part, place and part that Delaware case is played in Brown v. Board of Education. Thanks, David. And I look forward to the questions that are coming through the chat. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Lynette. And, um, and the key thing is on the programming, we've developed a, a quite a few number of partners in our programming. And the key thing would be that we're all really struggling. And I include myself at the top of that list on trying to create that higher levels of cultural competency and to really understand what it's like to um, have experienced racism or gender issues or bias or ethnicity or religion and to be able to teach people how to be more competent culturally and also how to really make the world a better place. There's been an awful lot of polarization in the last few years. And we feel like between all of our locations and all of our um, hearts and souls, that there really is an opportunity to bring the people that are conscious enough to realize that we're all equal and that we need to all treat each other equally and respect each other equally. And having the, uh, the late legacy of what happened in our school and at Howard and at Claymont as a foundation to be able to create 
this type of social change and also what I call to uh, elevate people's understanding of what social infrastructure is in the future is really uh, unlimited, limited opportunity. And we just feel like the programming is really the key to that. Um, next slide, please. So most of all, as we close out our presentation, we would love, we would like to express our tremendous amount of gratitude for all of the people whose shoulders we stand on and all of the people that have been integral in getting us to reach this festive occasion of being hopefully 60 days plus or minus away from being able to have Sunny and the students walk back through the door again. And in particular, thank you to the National Trust, and Leslie and Pam and Priya and, and everyone who's been so inclusive of us in bringing us into the whole National Park Service affiliate site process. The former Hocassin students, as we said, we have gotten to know you and love you, and you are our inspiration for all we do as volunteers. And, and it's really hard to capture Senators Kuntz and Carper and Representative Lisa Blunt Rochester and particular Senator Jim Clyburn, Senator or Governor John Carney and Newcastle County Executive Matt Meyer. They are so dedicated and accessible and supportive and in every way to us being able to get to the point where we are today that it's just amazing that they, they care so much about all this and have really been the ones that have allowed us to get to this point in so many ways. So we're full of gratitude and we're also full of excitement and anticipation about what we can do that really will be transformational to the future of society. And that's a pretty lofty goal, but I think everyone that's on this call is in, invited to join the party and help us to create better communities, more unity and better understanding and acceptance of each other, regardless of any other factor. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, we, we're actually over time, but are there any um, questions um, that we can answer? Leslie, this is Priya. There's one from P. Durham that you might want to respond to in the Q&A. I can read it if you'd like me to. Yeah, can you? Okay. Um, it's uh, from D. The effort for recognition for these schools is fabulous. Our understanding is that the SHPO is reluctant to pursue National Register status for Hawkinson because its interior lacks historic integrity. The exterior, however, is very much intact. Such significant buildings should be on the register, which is a separate question, which is a separate question from the designation. How can we all work together to make this happen to gain NPS support? Um, I can answer that. D. How are you? Thank you for your question. It's good to, good to hear from you. Um, we have a plan for the property involving uh, working with the county. Oops, sorry, hold on. Um, work, working with the county and um, other stakeholders and particularly the Historic Review Board to uh, ultimately um, get put a historic overlay in place for the school um, once we get our um, occupancy and once we finish up what we're doing and we have some plans that I haven't had a chance to catch up with you on that are, are really exciting as far as how we can make that work. And uh, we have no problem trying to um, continue to create national registration as well. So, um, and that's something that we always plan to do, but we really um, felt a tremendous sen sense of urgency because the students are, um, we're losing, we've lost some of our students, former students recently over the, in 2022, Mr. and Mrs. Jean Fleming, Robert and Jean, um, and we want to try and get everyone to walk through the door again as soon as possible, and we will absolutely be historically preserving everything about the property that we can. David, um, another question just came in, and I think Leslie, you or Pam can um, respond to this, but is the focus of the National Trust work primary in New primarily in Newcastle County? And I thought this would be a good opportunity to talk about the other sites. Um, so no, so in general, the, the work of the National Trust 
is not just centered in Newcastle County. For this particular project, um, the work of the trust is centered around um, sites in South Carolina, uh, DC, Virginia, um, Kansas, and then in Delaware. Um, so it's it's focused on sites uh, related to the Brown v. Board case. Um, so not just uh, Newcastle County. Great, and I just put in the chat the first link of a series of webinars that we've been doing on this work over the last year or so. Um, that link is for the first webinar, but if you scroll all the way to the bottom, I've got links to the other three we have done, and I'll add the recording for this one on this page as well, as long as uh, as well as putting it on its own page. Um, I think those are all the questions that we've gotten in the chat. Um, and so, Leslie, I'm going to leave it to you to close us out. Okay. Um, so since we're over time, um, let's see, the next one is uh, keep the discussion going on uh, Form Connect. This is our online community for people in the business of saving places. We have active conversations happening all week around topics from Section 106 to women's history at, at historic sites. If you haven't joined Connect yet, you should. It's a great place to keep up this conversation and start more. Please join us for these upcoming Preservation Leadership Forum webinars. On April 12th at 2 p.m. Eastern, we will be hosting a webinar calculating carbon savings from building reuse and retrofit. And finally, thank you to everyone who attended today's webinar. A special thank you to our speakers for sharing their knowledge and expertise with us. If you have any questions following this webinar, please don't hesitate to contact us. Our email is forum at savingplaces.org. Thank you.